If you have your Bibles, I'd like to share today from Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse 1. My Bible has a kind of a title for this and is, is of course, called the Triumphal Entry. But that term is not actually in Scripture. It's been given that name by, I suppose, some Bible scholars. The triumphal entry is like a victorious benediction of the earthly ministry of Christ. If the Bible were a written novel, it would be a fitting ending. Everything would seem to have been falling into place if the Bible was a, a novel story. So I'd like to read the first 11 verses of chapter 11. Now when they drew near Jerusalem to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you have entered it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street. They loosed it, but some of those who stood there said to them, What are you doing loosening the coat, colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. When those who went before him and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus went to Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked around at all things, as the hour was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It's been uh, a number of years ago when Bill Clinton was president, and near where we lived in Briary Branch, there is a peak there called Reddish Knob. And it is basically right on the line between West Virginia and Virginia, very high peak. We could drive up there probably about 10 miles or so from where we lived. It was interesting to me because I could go up on that peak and on a very clear day I could actually see the smokestack or at least where the, the smoke and steam was coming out on the Vepco Mount Storm Power Station. I could look which would be about 90 miles away and actually see that. It had to be a clear day. Well one day we heard that President Clinton was coming to Reddish Knob. He wanted to use that setting to sign some type of bill. And so we heard that President Clinton was coming and that he would land his helicopter right beside the church in an open field there. Well, it didn't take long for word to get around that the president was coming to Briar Branch. So we knew about what time the helicopter was going to land, at least what they told us. And so the people of Briary Branch came out to the church 
Some of them brought lawn chairs and sat and waited for the helicopter to come. And they thought they might get a glimpse of the president as he got into motorcade and then drove to the top of Reddish Knob. Kind of humorous, they came out, some of them was waving American flags. <laughs> All for the president to come. And do you know that in advance of him coming, they actually paved the road from Briar Branch to Reddish Knob? Now that's pretty amazing. I even came out myself. I worked it into my schedule that I could be there for the glorious event. But you know what happened? He landed in a different place. He never came and landed right there in Bribery Branch. All we saw was the helicopters going overhead. And so we waved. But it was a pretty grand uh, entry, to say the least, for just about a half an hour that the president spent on Reddish Knob. It was televised, at least him being there. Well, Jesus had a very similar uh, entry into Jerusalem here. And this is very much in keeping with the way it worked in the Old Testament. And so they would have the feast of the Passover. And five days before the feast, the sacrificial lamb would be selected. And so they would bring the, the lamb in to the area then about five days ahead. Well, as it turns out, Jesus, who is the sacrificial lamb of the world, would come into Jerusalem five days before he was to be crucified. This is just days earlier. And in Mark, we have how Jesus prepared for this even. It illustrates his power and control over every specific thing in life. And I think about that in my life. I don't know how things are going to turn out. I can get sort of anxiety over a simple car repair. And I have uh, many times prayed that the Lord would heal my car. Or at least the repair would not be too bad. Jesus knows every detail of our lives. He instructs the disciples, two of them. We don't know for sure who, which two, could have been James and John. But he instructed them to go to a village and so Mark would write down go into a village opposite you and so you will find the colt there and select that colt and bring him back and even more specifically he said that the people nearby would be in support it would be okay with them to bring this colt to him. And even more specific than that, this would be a colt that had never been ridden by a man. You see, Jesus is in control of all things. He can work in our lives today beyond what we can imagine. We can and I would suggest many of us have experienced miraculous provisions in our lives. He has opened up doorways for me in my life. I suspect he has for you also. He's also closed a few doors. And I rejoice at the opening and sometimes fret at the closing, but yet and when I know that Jesus is in control, even when opportunities seem to disappear, I have tried to condition myself to just wait. The Bible speaks of waiting on the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall walk, not be weary. They shall run and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, 
to wait. My father-in-law used to say that life was a lot of hurrying up and waiting. He was telling me that about my marrying his daughter. It was hurry up and wait. And so the Lord can have us wait sometimes, but Jesus can move the heart of people. I've seen people make decisions that I would not have thought they, they would. But Jesus can move the hearts of people in his providence. Now the providence of God is the perfect will of God that will be accomplished. God's providence is at work in your life and my life. We can be provided for right in the middle of our needs. And I trust and pray that the next time that I have a critical need, I will stand in faith and know that Jesus has this in my life. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord of all creations. So the disciples went their way, it says here, and found the colt tied by the door. And interesting enough, there were some people there who asked, what are you doing loosening the coat? And they told these people that the Lord has need of this. And they said, okay. Jesus working in the hearts of people. And so they seemed to prepare it for Jesus when they brought the, the coat back. And so verse 7 says they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it. And he sat on it. They simply put their clothes over the colt. You know what this tells me? They used what they had. I don't know if they had saddles back then or not. doesn't matter. They didn't have a, a saddle but they put their very clothes on the coat and Jesus sat on the coat. As far as I'm aware of, it is the only time in scripture that we are told Jesus rode anything. I'm taking it that he walked. Even the coat submissive. A coat that no one had ever rode if these coats, coats was like horses, usually the first per person to sit on them had a ride. But this coat was even submissive to Jesus. Jesus is in control of all things. And so Jesus began his journey to Jerusalem. One that is actually set in, set in prophecy. In Zechariah, I believe it's verse 9, 9, there is actually the prophecy of the Messiah riding on a coat. So this fulfilled prophecy, even this very act. And so then we have a reaction of the crowd of people. I'm sure Jesus knew that this was going to happen. I wonder how the disciples responded. So he rode in, and many spread their clothes on the road. This is a type of biblical paving. They put their clothes on the road and put the branches down so that the colt could walk on top of it. He received a festive welcome. He was recognized as a king coming to set up his earthly kingdom. Now there, there is the catch. These people believed that Jesus was coming to set up an earthly kingdom right now. And part of that would be to rid Jerusalem and the area of the Roman control and they were very happy about what Jesus was going to do in that day. 
that very day. And it's a little short-sighted, you might say. A carnal mistake we can make is to focus on this present life and not have the perspective about what Jesus is doing in the long term. And I have to notice that a lot of my prayers are about what Jesus can do today. And I want the Lord to hurry up. Grant my prayer today. Especially if I'm suffering. It's only natural for me to want Jesus to react quickly to my prayer. The crowd reacted joyfully. And they shouted. They anticipated great victory, but the way Jesus came in would more speak that he was coming for peace. Not as a victory in the war, but coming for peace. Each one joyfully shouted about the new coming age. You know, while I want Jesus to answer my prayers quickly... I want to also be mindful of the greater perspective. And sometimes, as we see abundantly clear in Scripture, Jesus' plan for us can involve a little bit of discomfort in our own lives. I mean, I, I think about Joseph, for instance. And he spent years in prison for a while. And I think about M Moses and what he experienced, the kind of challenges that they had in the wilderness. A lot of people uh, suffered as God was working in their lives. And that's the way it can be in my, my life as well. A few weeks ago, you know, I shared about the role of suffering in the life of the Christian. Usually it involves the greater perspective. What God is doing in the long term might re result in some challenges that I have right now. Now, my physical material mind tends to focus on the immediate. Get me past this, Lord. Let's go on. Back in the 80s, there was many who were called the religious right. They sort of rose up in the political spectrum a little bit. They were striving for a godly nation. And I have to say that I support many of the values that the religious right was striving for at that time. But it seemed to me like they wanted some immediate results. They wanted to impact the government and society so forcefully that they could see an immediate change and sometimes we have to be careful when focusing solely on earthly achievements. God has a greater plan in mind than what's just going to happen tomorrow. Now, he can certainly affect tomorrow. Recently, we had the Supreme Court ruling against abortion. They reversed the Roe versus Wade which seemed to be an impossibility. I tell you, I never thought I would ever see that case reversed. But wh what do you know? It did. But, you know, even the reversal of a court case did not unite America on abortion. In fact, I seem to, to be aware of more protests of the so-called abortion right, I call it the right to death, and it is far from a victory just that this Roe versus Wade was overturned. Well, that what happened on that one single day, but it didn't solve the issue. Many times we want what Jesus could do for us right now. 
This very crowd within days would be screaming, crucify him. Think about that. The crowd, the very same people who was saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, in just a few days would be screaming before Pilate, crucify him, execute him. They quickly joined together in their desire to kill Jesus. You know what that speaks to me of? That these people were very superficial, shallow in their response to Jesus as he came to Jerusalem. And personally, I fear the American church is rather shallow. The American church is shallow in their commitment and worship. We have not been tested, and that could quickly change. The church in America could one day be tested and persecuted in ways we can't imagine. Churches are generally hesitant to stand against godless activities. It's a sad attitude of the church that would say, let me alone. Do as you please. Just let me alone. Do we have any courage as Christians today? Or would we just superficially sing a few worship songs and go home? Leave me alone is what the church could be saying. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And every time I read this verse, I want to do this. You know why? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and movable, always abouncing in the work of the Lord. Oh, that's not abouncing. That's abounding. I still want to do this. Always a bouncing in the work of the Lord. I question myself, am I superficial in my serving God? Do I only want to go so deep and no deeper? Just leave me alone. I go so far, but, but don't make me uncomfortable. How committed am I to the witness for Christ? What voice do I give to show God's love? I think all of us should answer the question, will I stand up for godly values in my life? Will I risk anything for the sake of the witness of Christ, for the sake of the church? Jesus was only days away from his mock trial and execution. And every one that shouted, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everyone deserted Jesus. Every time I look at this passage, rather than to shout for joy at the triumphal entry, I question myself. Am I like these people? who shouted for joy for a little bit when it was convenient, when it was popular, but they reversed themselves immediately and turned against Christ, against any witness that they had for the blessed Christ who came in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that my attitude towards serving God is more than just skin deep. I pray that I might be committed to the Lord. That I might be willing to go where he wants me to go, do what he wants me to do, even though it might involve stepping out of my comfort zone. I need the help of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to give me strength 
and wisdom to be a witness for Christ in this place. In this life, I want to share that Christ's love is preeminent and he loves everyone. And so I pray that we all here today have received Christ as our Lord and Savior. I pray that we have come to him who is always there for us and said, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I want to accept you as Savior. I want to accept the eternal life that you give. And also I want to strive to live for you in this life. Lord, this simple prayer you will hear and answer immediately. And we will be one of the blood-washed Christians that you empower in this life. I thank you for what is called the joy of the Lord. May the joy of the Lord be my strength, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.